Hi, Takuzo. Hi, Andrew. Hello. Hi, Andrew. Uh, How are you? I'm good at yourself, Takuzo. Takuzo is currently silent. I'm Marty. Oh, it's Marty. It's Marty. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Nice to meet you. And nice to meet you as well. Welcome. We'll just give um everyone about five minutes to join, and then we'll right. go ahead and begin. So feel free to wait. Perfect. Perfect. I try to be on time. Thanks for that email. I no think problem. for some random reason, your yeah. um, when you send the Zoom link, it saves yeah. an hour ahead. So like on my Google calendar, it serves yeah. at 3 p.m. So I would have been late as well. Oh, wow. We need to correct like that. What happened last time? So I don't know what's happening with the settings. Um yeah, we'll we'll just fix that. We'll correct that so that um we we don't get anyone joining late. Thanks for that for catching that. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheers. Hi, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, welcome. Nice to meet you. Hi, Takuzwa. Hello, Marty. How are you? I'm good. Yourself? Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. How is Kenya? Yeah. The weather is playing tricks on us. One time it's cold, then it's raining, then it's, the sun is out. It's, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. How's how's it been after elections? Um, it's, it's, it's relatively quiet. Yeah. No chaos. Yeah, we hope it to continue like that. <laughs> yes, how do I get the African Alliance backdrop? <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling left out. <laughs> Actually, we, we can provide one for, for members only. <laughs> Hi, Rasigan. Greetings, good colleagues. Hope everyone's all right. We're good. Nice, nice to have you here with us. Excellent. giving everyone um a few minutes to join and then mm -hmm. we'll kick off excellent okay nice to have you timothy as well
Hi, Yoba. How are you? We'll give it six more minutes and then we will just begin our program. Great. So we shall begin. Um, it's great to have all of you here. I hope you've been having a, a great month. Uh, welcome to the uh, Civil Society Organization meeting um, for August. Um, we are so happy to have you here, especially for this special edition, where we'll be having the Health Justice Initiative representative, Dr. Malise. Uh, speaking about um, and just giving context about the work of the Health Justice Initiative, um, what they do, how they operate, um, and, and there'll be special focus on the legal action and uh, a type of advocacy um, that they that they usually pursue. And then a bit later on, she'll uh, zero in on their, their recent win um, in the court proceedings against the National um, Department for Health um, in South Africa. Um, she'll give a bit more background about what the case, um, what uh, motivated them to pursue this case, um, and also what the case was about, what the main argument was, and what ultimately led them to uh, victory within their judicial system, um, and why this is such a big deal for uh, vaccine equity and vaccine justice um, across the African continent. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, uh, Malise will be joining shortly, and, and she'll give more context into that. Um, so this this civil society meeting is hosted by the People's Vaccine Alliance Africa, um, of which I'm the coordinator, and I have various uh, team members here, including Barak and, and Takuzwa, and we're so happy to be connecting with you, um, because with your help, we continue to work in, in ways that continue to advance um, health justice and vaccine equity um, across the continent. Um, we work specifically with, with you as our members, just in terms of information, in terms of some help as well. And we also uh, work with um, different subgranting partners, which is what Barak deals with. Uh, membership is what Takuzo deals with. And I deal with the uh, general um, coordination of all the other projects that we, uh, we run um, across the continent in all five regions. So that's just a brief of, of PV Africa. We continue to be hosted by the African Alliance, led by our, our chair, Tian Johnson, as well as um, our steering group, our steering committee, as well as the secretariat. Um, so that's that's um, about uh, PV Africa. 
Um, welcome, Marlies. Glad to see you. <laughs> you joined us. Our guest Hello. Of honor. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, so I was just giving an introduction of, of uh, the People's Vaccine Alliance Africa. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Takuzo for uh, a short membership update uh, before we'll, we'll welcome you back to, um, to take us through the Health Justice Initiative. Thanks a lot. Uh, Takuzo, are you ready? Oh, yes, yes. I'll just give a brief overview of the membership update of PV Africa. So no. allow me to share my screen. Okay, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yes, you can see it. Yes, yes, it is on. Thank you. So I'll be giving you a very brief overview of the PV Africa membership how our membership looks like in different regions of Africa, that is Southern Africa, East Africa, North Africa, West Africa, and Central Africa. Um, so PV Africa, its main mandate is to ensure that the voices of Africans, like in different countries, are meaningfully represented in global affairs. So to do that, we work with, closely with different uh, CSOs, civil society organizations in, uh, in different countries across the continent. So currently, uh, we have uh, 93 members that are validated and active in different countries of in different parts of, of of Africa. That is some in Southern Africa, some in East Africa, some in West Africa. So I'll be going through with you how many members we have in each region. So in Southern Africa, currently we have 37 validated members. So the, the majority of these members in Southern Africa they work in in community mobilization, in HIV, in public health. And in East Africa, we also have uh, 22 validated members. Sorry for that mistake. In East Africa, we have 22 validated members. And most of our members are based in countries such as Kenya and Tanzania. And most of them work in sectors such as sex work, public health, and, and, and community mobilization. So for part of our strategy for this 2023 year is to engage more with CSOs from countries such as Somalia, South Sudan, where the health rights of most of the citizens of these countries are often denied or violated because of political instabilities in these countries. So if you know any CSOs that work in these countries, you're welcome to share with us so that we can contact them to see if we can work together to advance the work of PV Africa. In North Africa, we have three active members in North Africa. And 2023, also our, 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 our strategy is to increase our presence in, in the region. So we are also trying to increase uh, our presence in countries such as Sudan, such as Libya, uh, who are also underrepresented in most of these uh, affairs, usually because of the political instabilities in these countries. So again, if you know uh, CSOs that work in these countries, uh, you can you can tell them to contact us, or you can give them so that we can contact them to see if we can work with them to advance uh, the health rights of people that are living in these countries. In Central Africa, we also have 17 validated members with most of them are focusing on public health and research, that is research in the health sector. So in, 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 in Central Africa, the most represented country in this region is Cameroon being followed by DRC. So you see that we have seen also that uh, in Central Africa, most of our partners, they are all mostly focused in Francophone countries, that is countries that speak French. So in 2023, we're also trying to increase our presence in Lusophone countries. So those are Portuguese speaking countries such as Equatorial Guinea, such as uh, 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 Cape Verde, such as Angola. Then in West Africa, we also have 14 validated members that we work with. So most of our members in West Africa, they focus on sectors such as the public health, such as research and such as sex work. So the majority of our members in, 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 in West Africa, we've seen that they come from Anglophone countries such as Ghana, such as Nigeria. So our strategy again for this month, for this year going forward, is to try to increase our presence in Francophone countries such as Cote d'Ivoire and, and, and Burkina Faso. So you see that our members are actually uh, distributed uh, for, across different sectors, such as community mobilization, public health, and, and also sex work. The, the idea is for us to have a human uniform representation, especially of key sectors such as LGBTQ+, such as sex work, that are most of the time underrepresented in this in the in, in, in affairs of, 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 of global health rights. 
So we are also trying to increase our, our, our presence in these key sectors. So you see that in, 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 our, in the representation of our members, the most represented sector is actually community mobilization, which accounts for 17.4% of all the members. And the least represented sector is sex workers, which only accounts for about 3% of, of, of our members. So our idea is, is to engage with more organization that represents the health rights of sex workers to ensure that this segment of the population is also meaningfully represented. So I'll also be giving you a very brief summary of, 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 of the uh, vaccine landscape across the globe and also in Africa. So as of July, from the work that you, from the research that you have been doing, you saw that around 13.4 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered worldwide. And about 68% of, 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 of WHO members said have been vaccinated. Like that is, th these countries have reached 70% vaccine rate or more. And you see that in these countries, at least on average, 89% of health workers have achieved a complete primary series and 82% of adults have achieved a complete primary series. So most of, you see most of the time. Okay, sure. Thank you, Raskan. You do that. So you see that most of, 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 of the time, you see that uh, these groups were the ones that were mostly focused at the start of, of the of vaccination campaigns. So they have higher vaccination rates as compared to other groups, such as young uh, adults. So you see that 66% of the general population globally has achieved a, uh, uh, a complete primary series. But you see that only 27% of low-income countries, that is countries that are mostly based in Africa, have not achieved uh, the 70% that is needed to achieve herd immunity. So you see that across Africa, when we, we, here we are saying that we have 13.4 billion doses that have been administered worldwide, and only around 1 billion uh, doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Africa. Uh, and you see that 95% of these uh, uh, doses have been fully utilized, thus vaccinating around 31% of the continent which is still far away from the target of 75% to 85% that is needed uh, to achieve herd immunity. And this is that some of the countries have completely gone off track to achieve uh, their targets, such as some countries such as uh, Malawi, uh, having reached only around 21% against a target coverage of 70%. We also have Ghana, which is also only vaccinated around 27% uh, of, of its population against its target that it had set of 72%. So I think another update that is very important is uh, the, the rising of, 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 of another new COVID-19 variant called EG5, which is also commonly called ARIS. So you can, it has been um, observed that it has now become the most dominant variant in the United States, which has led the World Health Organization to classify it as a variant of, 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 of interest. So that means this variant has genetic uh, changes that has happened to it that are different to other to other to other variants, which makes it a difficult and a, 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 a variant of interest. So you see that this variant has also has been reported in some uh, parts of Africa, such as South Africa, which brings about the importance of meeting targets that are essential for achieving herd immunity. So we're saying in Africa right now we're at 31%, but we need at least 70 to 75%, uh, or some say 70 to 85% for us to be able to, to achieve herd immunity. So those are main updates that I have for you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, Matt, you can take it from me. Thank you so much, uh, Takuzo, for giving us that update. Um, it's really important, especially as, as Takuzo has said, just to reiterate that um, due to the emergence of the EG5 uh, variant, I think it's more important and now more than ever to focus on um, some of the countries that have been, you know, kind of deadline or off track when it comes to meeting their COVID-19 set vaccination targets. And to that end also, just to inform you that BV Africa is, is releasing a newsletter um, next week, um, which focuses on the narratives of some of the countries that have been off track or have missed their deadlines. Um, for this edition, we focus on Ghana and South Sudan. We we're happy to get contributions from um, David. I can see David here. Um, we got some contributions from David uh, from Ghana. Um, Ghana's deadline is uh, supposed to be the end of this year. Um, they were initially on track, but now things have slowed down a bit. So we're just running some um, advocacy in terms of the newsletter and some pieces um, and analysis from PV Africa um, to give some advice so that uh, they can see how to step up the efforts. And then there's South Sudan. 
who stopped uh, COVID-19 vaccination data reporting in May this year. So as of now, uh, nobody knows um, how many infections or how many vaccinations still have been done in that region. So we're just doing some work around that. And when that is ready, we'll be so happy to share with you so that you can assess in your respective countries um, how better to step up the COVID-19 efforts so that the EG5 um, variant doesn't um, disrupt um, health and just life uh, on the African continent. Great. Um, so now is the time that we've all been waiting for. Um, we, we will have a presentation from the Health Justice Initiative. Um, the presentation is by Dr. Marlies, um, who is here um, now. Um, so Dr. Marlies, we thank you so much for, for your time. Um, but just before that, I see Rasigan has, has <laughs> raised his hand. Rasigan, go ahead, just <laughs> before Dr. Marlies begins. Uh, and my apologies, Malise. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I, I want to raise a question about the data that's been presented, if that's all right, Marty. Yes, bro, if you can keep it short and sweet, that's good. No, absolutely, I will. So, yeah. you know, it's very important us having a quantitative sense about what's taking place around us. But for us to make use of the quantities that we are talking about, we must know the quality of the data itself. So I'm raising this because in other sectors, such as science and technology, uh, such as education, the data coming from the 55 units that comprise Africa is not at the same level. In some instances, we are dealing with census data that gets extrapolated year after year. And we don't anymore know the actual baseline of demography on the continent. Why I raise this, Marty, is because many of the points you raise are about percentages. So when we say 70% of a population, but we don't know what the population is, what is the exact number that we are chasing? So it's a point that I raise, and I really want to encourage, we should look at at least, you know, a correlating the data that you have on hand with World Health Organization, with UNICEF, and at least with UNESCO. And in that, please indicate when the last date, I'm sure Maldives knows this is a problem throughout the continent itself. And it's really something we have to also redress. We can't continue running forward uh, as blind as we are. Thanks so much for allowing that. Yeah. No problem. Uh, thanks, Russ, again, for putting everything into context tonight. Yeah, it is important. And actually, the data that we're using is developed by um, WHO um, in consultation with Gavi as well from the COVAX initiative. And it actually shows, um, you know, for South Sudan, for example, it's um, about 12 million people. And, you know, that kind of data is important. But what we're focusing more on is the stories on the ground from the civil society organizations that are actually doing um, the work in terms of... Um, you know, pandemic preparedness um, and prevention as well. So yeah, just to bring some context, we'll be sharing that with you next week, just so that you can have a compre comprehensive outlook on all that. Sorry for hijacking you, uh, Malif, but now you may go ahead. Uh, thank you, you can, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, colleagues. And a big uh, thanks to Marty and to Kudzwa who helped at the last minute. Uh, with my emails. So apologies for uh, arriving a little bit late. Um, and for Takudzwa sharing his, uh, his Zoom URL with me so that I could join you this afternoon. Um, Mati, do you, can you give me an uh, indication of how long you would like for me to speak? And then I'll set my alarm. That's fine. Um, you have, as I see it, you have 35 minutes. 35 minutes. You're still happy yeah. with that? Okay. Yeah. Let me... Let me try and make it shorter so that uh, that we can uh, engage a little bit on the content because I'm really um, I'm really interested to to hear um, colleagues' views on this case um, and how uh, it might impact on uh, on the continent um, and in different contexts. So my brief this afternoon um, is to just share a little bit of background um, about the Health Justice Initiative, which is where I work. Um, in uh in South Africa um and then to to talk uh, about uh, the open contracts case uh that we um that we are busy uh busy with at the moment and the the presentation that I will will do this afternoon uh draws very much on the materials that are available on our website um 
and I will share the URL shortly. Unfortunately, I can't see my chat screen at the moment with the, the way that the my windows are set up, but I'll provide a, a URL if you want to um, look at some of the judgments or some of our social media materials. Um, and I'll also share the slides afterwards. So if there's any material that you would find useful, um, I'll be very happy um, for you to access that. Um, so just a bit of background to, to our organization. Um, we were established in the midst of COVID um, and we we focus on the intersection of, of health and law. Um, and we focus very specifically um, on the intersection with, uh, with racism um, and sexism. And we use the, the lens of health equity in, in delving into the issues of access to healthcare um, in South Africa, but also on the African continent and very much focused on, on the global South. We have four objectives. Um, and with within the South African context, looking at efforts to bring South Africa to universal health coverage um, in terms of the SDGs. And that takes the form very much of our national health insurance bill, in which I will say a few words, to look at the broader structural determinants of ill health. Um, and the legal and socioeconomic barriers that people face. And I know this is this is work that the, the PBA Africa is very involved in. And then looking at specifically on access to medicine um, and to, to focus on mechanisms to ensure affordable and fair access to life-saving medical technologies and products. And then especially in, in terms of the case that I will address a bit more uh, in more detail later, is the issue of transparency and accountability uh, in not just the, the private sector, but also in the public sector, specifically around statutory, regulatory, regulatory and oversight bodies. So to place the, the case in the back on in the context of other work that we are involved in. I thought I would just say a few words on, on some of the projects that, that we're dealing with at the moment. Um, and the one that I'm very excited about is the launch of a, a compendium, which will happen in two weeks time. Uh, let me just move the screen a little bit. Um, that tries to capture some of the, the very difficult lessons uh, that we learned uh, in, in South Africa and in the global South uh, around the COVID pandemic. And it uh, includes chapters written by a variety of people um, who've looked at um, manufacturing capacity and accountability, um, looking forward to pandemic preparedness, and then specifically the, the issue of the TRIPS waiver and what, uh, what the implications have been around vaccine nationalism or vaccine apartheid and how we can avoid that um, in the future. So that's a compendium that will be launched in two weeks. Um, I hope people will be able to join that and we'll make that uh, that compendium available um, on, on our website. It contains a number of key advocacy materials that the PBA um, Global uh, were involved in um, producing over the last three or four years. Then returning to universal health coverage, um, we've been grappling a lot with the National Health Insurance Bill in South Africa and whether that will bring about universal health coverage. Our concern has specifically been access to medicines um, and the selection, pricing and procurement uh, that this bill will allow or not allow. And we've, we've produced the issue brief uh, around some of our concerns and have, have been convening webinars um, to delve into these very technical issues that will then um, culminate in some recommendations on how we might be able to strengthen this legislation. Some of the work that I'm uh, more closely involved in is the issue around equitable post-trial benefit sharing. And we are advocating for greater transparency and accountability, especially around pub publicly funded or university-based research. And we make the argument strongly that if, if a product has been tested within a host country, then if that product has been found to be efficacious and safe, there needs to be mechanisms put into place in the clinical trial, uh, clinical trial product line that makes that product accessible to patients in those host countries, not just the research participants. Um, and this is this is a tricky area of work with a lot of resistance. Um, 
but we are, it's it's part of a broader project that will that will see the engagement with universities and regulatory authorities um, and especially emphasizing the importance of equity within research um it would be really really interested if there are other people's other people on this on this webinar who's interested in this issue um for us to to, to get into contact about um the subject area then a few words about the Global South uh, consultation that we held in Rio um, in April, where we looked specifically at the intersection of health equity and climate justice. And uh, the proceedings uh, captured in, in this report, um, and also some really useful speakers um, helping us to understand uh, the contributions we might be able to make in, in terms of health equity and and health justice and climate justice then some or another project that i'm involved in um around coalition building um and advocacy is a collective uh, coalition of of organizations and individuals in south africa um that are resisting and calling out health xenophobia um, and you you might have seen reports uh, about the escalation in in violent forms of of xenophobia, especially in public health facilities, uh, through more organised xenophobic groups like Operation Dedula. And our coalition um, has spoken out strongly against uh, health xenophobia, and have um, been involved in producing research and advocacy materials and, and a communication strategy to raise awareness of the, the dangers of, of health xenophobia um, and a call on, on our leadership and government to provide healthcare services uh, for all. Now to the, the cases um, and the litigation that I want to speak about specifically this afternoon. During the pandemic, we launched three cases um, on what we broadly called the the theme of pandemic secrecy. And uh, the first two revolved around open decision making and our emphasis that the decisions that government um, and regulatory authorities um, and research organizations make need to be uh, need to be transparent and they need to be accountable. And the first had to do with the advice uh, that was given to to the, our Department of Health by, by scientific experts in South Africa when it was called uh, the commit the advisory bodies that uh, provided um, advice to to South Africa's uh, COVID response was called the ministerial advisory committees um, and they provided regular uh, memoranda to the Minister of Health and part of our concern and those of, of many others is that this advice wasn't put in the public domain and we argued that in order to build trust um, in government's response in the pandemic, uh, these memorandums should be in should be accessible by the public, so that um, that they could serve as a as a point of of education, but also to to hold the government accountable to the decisions that they make with uh, that would concern the health um, of everyone in South Africa. The second case uh, was around the Sasonke. Uh, clinical trial um, on the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, um, in which there were were five hundred thousand doses of Johnson and Johnson donated to South Africa to to vaccinate healthcare workers, and at the end of the trial, some of the leftover stock uh, was allocated to elite athletes and government officials, um, and who jumped the queue, who got vaccines before their age cohort. And we asked questions around how these, how this regu how this approvals came about um, when there was very clear ethical guidelines about how vaccines needed to, uh, needed to be distributed at a time of great scarcity. Uh, we launched access to information, uh, uh, access to information requests in both of these cases. And through that process, um, we we were able to ascertain information that wasn't in the in the public domain, um, and we subsequently withdrew withdrew those two cases. The third one that I will talk about a bit more is the open contracts case, um, and this is essentially about vaccine procurement and secrecy and our as our right to access to information um, in terms of uh, of public. Uh, public right to that information. 
So at the at the heart of this case is our request that government needs to make public the contracts that it had signed with pharmaceutical manufacturers um, and the range of other bodies like COVAX and, and Avat. And that we also interested to see how those contracts were negotiated. So the memorandums of understanding and the meetings and minutes of, of those meetings. So a bit of context, and I think some people might go to sleep when they see see this because of uh, of all the all the data that you you all aware of. But in in terms of South Africa specifically, um, at least by the early by early twenty twenty two, at least uh, just more over thirty million vaccines were administered, and we know that we had received doses by dying many uh, doses from of vaccines by buying them from from pharma companies and that we also uh, received some from COVAX and some from donations. And these vaccines were procured at great cost. We don't know exactly how much, but at least the 2021 national budget uh, allocated 10 billion South African rands, which is just over $580 million for the purchase of COVID vaccines. But yet, Despite these huge numbers, we don't know what is in what we're in these agreements, and even who the the contracting parties are. Um. So, if we were aware how who some of the pharmaceutical companies were, we know we had Johnson and Johnson vaccines. We knew we had Pfizer vaccines, um, and we filed access to information uh, requests in terms of our promotion of access to information act, um, in South Africa. Um, for for these copies of the contract, um, but we didn't know for certain who all the contracting parties are. So we lodged it with our Department of Health, um, who's the custodian of health and who would have likely signed these contracts. Um, and our arguments relate very much to to public administration that needs to be accountable. Um, and for our procurement process in South Africa, uh, we believe there's a duty on government to procure those in a process that's fair, equitable, and transparent. And our hope with this case is that in the next pandemic, term, pandemic this information is automatically placed in the, in the public domain um, and that we don't have to take court action um, to ascertain these. This is a list of, the, of, uh, of who we think uh, we've got contracts with as the South African government. And you can see Johnson & Johnson is there. Aspen, Pfizer, Avad, COVAX, um, uh, Sinovac, and then also the Solidarity Fund that provided a deposit um, for our participation in the COVAX facility. I think it, it's useful just to highlight a few components around why we thought this court action was important. Um, and we, uh, in terms of the process, sorry, around this, this court action, and why it's taken so long. Um, we uh, got a response from the Director General of, of Health, um, who after receiving our request asked for a bit more time because the department said they needed to consult with the contracting parties uh, to make written or oral submissions on why they on, on the issue of whether the, these contracts should be released. Uh, we extended the deadline, um, and we didn't have a response. So we had no choice but to continue with legal action. Um, why this information is important in the court case is that we argue that vaccines are essential in the global response and that it's absolutely vital that, that people trust the government in terms of the, the pandemic decisions that they make. Um, and it is very important that government can show that they... Um, that it can reliably purchase the necessary medicines um, and that they have the capacity to roll this out. Um, we are aware that there was a lot of public suspicion um, within the pandemic towards government. And if there's a sense of secrecy, we argue that vaccine hesitancy and trust, the distrust in government increases and that these issues can be tackled by having more transparent, at more transparency about our negotiations uh, over the vaccines. Of course, public procurement is about public goods and uh, that requires contractual transparency. Um, and in the South African context, we've had a lot of allegations and also um, some clear evidence of 
uh, corruption, where uh, very, many of our much needed public resources have been diverted away from the COVID response and, and into private pockets. So in this against this background, it's even more important that we know what the terms uh, of the contracts are. So we argue that that the secrecy undermined the, the management of the pandemic. And we want to ensure that this doesn't happen again in, in the next in the next pandemic. We we brought this case in in uh in the public interest and we argued that it will empower people to people to know how public funds were spent if these contracts were placed in the public domain. We argue strongly that if there is an emergency, um, and especially a, a global public health emergency, that there's a heightened need for transparency and accountability, um, especially because some of the usual checks and balances aren't, aren't uh, available in an emergency where um, some of the mechanisms that ensure accountability fall away in, in the rapid need to deal with the crisis. Um, and that to ensure accountability and to monitor compliance um, with some of these contracts, they need to be in the public domain. Some of our arguments related uh, relate around why we need to see these contracts um, we believe that there have been a number of, of reports and statements uh, that have shown um, have shown that South Africa might have paid comparatively inflated rates for COVID vaccines. And I think there's very many uh, countries represented in this, this webinar today who might have been in the same position. The South African government had to grant broad indemn indemnification uh, for liability. Um, that would have been benefited the vaccine manufacturers. Um, we believe that South Africa was prevented from imposing export restrictions for vaccines filled and finished by um, some vaccine companies. Um, and some of the questions that arise um, are why we didn't, for example, serve on the pharmaceutical companies itself. Um, and we went to great lengths, our council went to great lengths to try and confirm who the contracting parties are so that we could serve on them. And when we reached out to, to some of the pharmaceutical companies, we either didn't get a response. Um, and from the Department of Health and Pfizer, um, they noted that the information of who the contracting parties are confidential. So it's not just what is in the contract, we're not even allowed to know who the who the South African government contracted with, um, with taxpayer money. So we believe when we if we were to see these contracts, hopefully we will be able to see if we paid more. We would know some of the conditions around the vaccines. Are we allowed to donate or sell on the vaccines? Um, the issues around the export restrictions, the issue of indemnity. And whether, importantly, whether we have recourse against late or no delivery of supplies, which we, which we know um, was a particular problem during the, the height of, of the lockdown and the height of the, the COVID, of the vaccine rollout, is that many countries were waiting um, and deadlines appeared and disappeared without some of the vaccines coming, um, coming to them. When we filed the papers, the department... Uh, Submit, uh, filed the answering affidavit. And I think three key, three issues to, to highlight from the department's affidavit um, is, is the emphasis that these, these contracts were negotiated in, in good faith. So if they were to, to put these contracts out, it would constitute a breach of the agreement um, because of the non-disclosure agreements that we assume are, are inside the, the contracts. Uh, the department noted that, that they would be worried that the disclosure would prejudice um, the uh, the vaccine manufacturers and that it would uh, prejudice the South Africa, South Africa in terms of future engagement and negotiations around medicines. And they believe that this information is governed by different principles, um, that somehow these vaccine contracts are uh, a different world to the normal procurement that we do. Um, and that they cannot be made available to the public. Um, we replied to that um, and said that we don't believe that those those are the that they've raised a sufficiently lawful ground for refusal. 
They didn't show us any of the clauses within the contract to show that um, that they precluded from um, from releasing the contracts, um, and that they have provided no evidence that there would be a future prejudice in terms of uh, of releasing this this information. Um, some of the departments. Uh, behavior undercut some of their claims. They they did speak about some provisions in the contract getting Parliament. So uh, in parliamentary sessions. So it's not as if there was a a blanket uh, refusal to talk about the contracts. There were instances where they did speak speak about aspects, but not the ones necessarily that we were interested in. The wheels of justice turned slowly, and and our first request was for information was launched in July, uh, twenty twenty one, and we eventually got our court date and 24th of July um, in the Gauteng um, division of, of our High Court. The judge reserved judgment and then just over a week ago um, we received news of the, the judgment and the, the judgment was in our favour. The short and sweet judgment that said uh, very clearly that government needed to supply the, the vaccine contract and then the second part, the, the negotiations and the meeting minutes um, needed to be provided to us within 10 court dates um, and the deadline for that um, would be tomorrow. This case made, made quite an impact um, in South Africa um, and I think also broader field. Um, where it was seen as a victory for transparency and accountability. Um, and and we argued in, in one of our press release that the that it's substantial funds um that have been um that have been invested in the vaccines um and that these are key issues that we we believe need to be in the public domain. This is a press release that uh that we released this morning. Um, we, we're very much aware that the deadline is tomorrow. Um, and we note that our council received uh, correspondence from the, de uh, the departments of health legal representatives who requested an extension until the end of September. Um, we, we did not grant that extension. Um, we, we said that the second part of our request, which is the meeting minutes and the MOUs, um, we'll, we'll be happy to receive that by the end of September. Um, but the, the contract, oh, sorry, the contracts, the MOUs and the agreements, the things that have been, been signed, uh, we would like to see um, within the deadline set by the court. So um, we haven't received any applications for leave to appeal. And we've also not received any uh, we haven't received any contracts from the department, and our our agreement is uh, that we've uh, offered to them was that they hand over the contracts by tomorrow, um, and then the other documents by the end of September. We believe that that if this was to succeed, and if we were to give, we would to get all these these uh, these documents. Um, it will give us a sense of, of what we agree to in South Africa, but it would also likely in other countries give them a sense of, of what type of uh, requirements pharmaceutical companies set in, in the, their dealings with, with governments. We, we believe that the South African government was likely bullied into accepting conditions that they wouldn't normally because of the, the power of pharmaceutical companies in the, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and we, we believe those contracts will help us to uncover um, the whether the bullying had taken place. Um, we believe that it will also, if we were to be able to access these these contracts, we believe that other countries, our own jurisdictions and other jurisdictions would have more leverage to demand open contracting within their contexts. Um, and that within South Africa, that it would, would benefit the uh, the negotiation around health procurement, um, especially under our national health insurance, that it will will benefit from this case by us being able to to more confidently um, argue for transparency. More more broadly, we believe that um, this would would be able to support the pandemic preparedness measures that I know some some people here are involved in. 
um, and that it would bolster civil society demands around transparency and accountability, especially around the ongoing pandemic treaty negotiations. And then just to to end off, um, we we're asking some of our allies um, to help push awareness of the of this case because we believe that um, that it will help in terms of pressuring uh, our government as well as the pharmaceutical companies to to hand over. Uh, hand over the documents um, and then also more more perhaps closer to home um, to explore what type of options exist within within your own context to demand greater transparency about health procurement. Um, I'm going to stop there. I'm aware that I've, I've spoken a lot um, and I'm going to switch off my screen or stop sharing so that I can see people's comments and I'm, I'm looking very forward to to hearing people's comments and questions. Thanks so much, um, Ali, for that comprehensive um, coverage of what the Health Justice Initiative is about, um, what you work on, um, as well as the, the recent uh, legal action um, that, that uh, happened last week um, that you, you won in, uh, to say it. <laughs> yeah, I can see Rasigan is, is applauding you. I'll open the, the floor to any questions or comments um, that, that any of you may have, um, particularly considering that this is a landmark victory um, on our continent in terms of um, civil society taking, uh, holding the government accountable um, in terms of, um, you know, vaccine um, justice, in terms of opening up the contracts um, that were there when, during the pandemic, when we were kind of bullied into accepting um, higher prices than usual, when uh, some of the global North countries kind of uh, hoarded the vaccines as well, you know, so, um, it's also kind of a call to pharma, you know, just in terms of fairness, you know, in terms of this is a pandemic, it's not to be for profit. It's it's an understanding that um, all all those measures of greed can't really go unpunished, and sometimes uh, we need at first to have all the information before then we can we can go on to have some action around it. And thank you, Health Justice Initiative, for leading the action um, around this. I see David. Uh, question. Go ahead, David. Okay, so good afternoon from Ghana. Um, happy to, to join you again this afternoon and uh, that the presentation is so rich and, and detailed, very inspiring. Uh, something that we really need here in Ghana uh, because there are still national controversies on how um, the money that the government of Ghana received during the COVID era is still uh, unaccountable. Uh, to the people of Ghana, um, you know, even during the pandemic era, the government uh, seems to provide some kind of subsidies on utilities such as water, electricity, uh, which largely benefited the middle and upper class and, and those in the rural communities who were hugely impacted by the COVID were not really benefiting. And unfortunately, uh, after the COVID-19, uh, Ghanaians have been charged COVID-19 levy, levy. They are paying a levy back to the states. So really, uh, it was not really subsidy in my, in my view. But more importantly, we still remain uh, you know, in the dark in terms of how the monies that the government received from the World Bank and WHO and those big organizations was used. Uh, the government has not accounted to the people of Ghana. So it's happy, I'm happy to see how this research is going and, and documenting lessons on Kind of advocacy that we are also able to put together here to demand for accountability and transparency in uh, the spending of the COVID money. My quick question is that um, how easy or difficult was it for you to um, assess public uh, data and information? In my country, Ghana, we have the, form, uh, the Public Information Act, which mandates every Ghanaian to be able to request for data from public offices. But in, in practical, in reality, it's not that easy. Some information, you have to pay for it. Others, you'll be frustrated. Others, you'll be delayed. So I'm curious to know how you're able to manage to get such sensitive national data to put together a very beautiful uh, report for us to really enjoy and be inspired. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, David, for that question. I think, Marlies, we'll just take the question from Peter as well so that you can just answer both of them at the same time. So, Peter, go ahead and ask your question. 
Yeah, thank you for that uh, uh, very nice analysis. Uh, I, I wish it could be extended to um, other global uh, uh, countries because we were made to understand that uh, there's a lot of money, public uh, money, that was also uh, used as um, advanced market uh, commitments, and that those all those manufacturers like Pfizer they never uh, delivered all the all the vaccines, and uh, this is an issue that has been raised in the U.S. regarding those commitments that were never delivered uh, as the COVID was going down. And we also know that uh, in Africa, we had a problem with the COVID, we call them COVID tapreneurs. Uh, 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 Alan is here. We are trying to follow up on what happened to the COVID money that was given to Africa on not only on vaccines, but mainly on uh, PPEs. Uh, they were all gone and resolved. And, and if we can form that partnership globally, it can help. Is it possible to have a global movement that can demand accountability, not only from the source, but also from the recipients? Thank you. Oh, shall I go ahead, Mati? Yes, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Mati. Thank you. Um, Peter and David, thank you. Uh, thank you for those questions. And I'm um, I'm very much under the impression of uh, some of the, the issues that you've been grappling with. Um, Peter, I'm not quite sure where you're from, but David in Uganda, what, what you were saying about the, the subsidies and the levies, um, I find really, um, really concerning. Um, and Peter, your your point around the what's happened to the COVID money, how much there was in the first place, and then how it's been spent and how there's just silence about that, I think is... Uh, yeah, again, a call for for our civil society push for the um for more accountability and transparency. And I think the the pandemic treaty uh, and the other international mechanisms um that we can still influence to ensure that that's part of international law, um I think is is a big um is a big issue um that I think uh, we need to focus on. Uh, David, to your question about the South Africa, South Africa's specific uh, freedom of access to information uh, legislation we have, um, and uh, I think you you were you were suggesting the difference between what the law says and how it, how it's actually implemented. Um, I think is is spot on. Um, South Africa has a very strong legal framework. Um, the Promotion of Access to Information Act. Um, I'll look it up and and put the URL in the in the in the chat box if you want to look at the legislation specifically, um, was very much, and I think this has to do with South Africa's apartheid past, where so much information was was suppressed, that when our, when our democracy came, there was a very strong push that information, the default should be that information should be in the public domain, and that the promotion of Access to Information Act, or what we call PIA, um, tried to make this information make these mechanisms as easy as possible. Um, and it requires public and private bodies to put manuals um, and specific information in the public domain um, to make it clear who the information, every every one of these entities need to have an information officer that you must be able to, to make requests to. Um, the form that you need to do it is a very simple, uncomplicated form. There's mechanisms to help um, people with disabilities to um, to fill in this form for people with um, with lower late, rates of literacy, um, and it provides a quick turnaround time. Um, if you if you lodge a request um, with the information officer of a government department or a, a public body. That person needs to respond to you within 30 days. So it it's quick sticks. Um, and then if you don't hear from them, it's deemed automatically as a refusal to provide that information. And you can then lodge an internal appeal, which again gives that organization 30 days to provide the information. Um regrettably, it would seem that very that some organizations and there's some government departments that are very good with with providing information and there's some that are dreadful that you don't that you don't hear any um that you don't get any response of uh any response from and that 
it's only if you have the means, or in this case, we we had pro bono legal counsel who could then take the the step of of launching court action, um, launching court action um, action in terms of of the act. Um, we also privileged to have a constitution that has in our Bill of Rights a very clear provision around the promotion of access to information. And I, I would be interested to hear from other people within the room uh, what they what their legal framework look like and whether they whether you have tried using the the mechanisms in terms of access to information in your country and and whether that's um had more success um than than we've had to do in in terms of uh having no choice but to eventually go to court on on this issue yeah so uh Melissa has asked a very um important question um uh, regarding access to to information, especially within our own context, does anyone have any um any contribution, uh, uh based on perhaps prior experience on trying to access information, um from the government or from the Ministry of Health or even from the local governing bodies, um, I think the most likely would like I don't know if David you've tried this before just to to access information. I I can give an example. My name is Christine. Go ahead, Good evening please. from Kenya. Uh, I've been able to use the access to information tool. And um, when I submitted the form to the county government, they were able to respond before the 21 days lapsed. They provided feedback for next time that they even came to the ground and uh, gave us the document that we wanted, a copy of the document, and they they did um, a survey to an extent that they brought the contractor on site and uh, construction of the health facility is going on at the moment as I'm speaking. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christine. Just to have some context, um, please could you let us know if it's not uh, confidential, what kind of information were you looking for from the county government? I'm going to assume it's um, the, from the county of Takamega in Kenya. Uh, it was in Takamega County, that's at the subnational level. Uh, what happens is uh, civil societies, we've been pushing for allocations through the county budgets. You find the allocation has been captured, but in real essence, during the financial year, nothing is going on on the ground. So what we did, uh, I mobilized the community, and then we formed a community action team. Through this community action team, it's when now we did the, we filled in the access to information, wanting to know why money has been allocated to this project, but there's nothing going on. We submitted, and in Kenya, they always say, we normally give it a total of 21 days. If they don't respond within 21 days, is when now you can go to court. So our deputy governor was first. He responded um, on the 11th day. He actually came on the ground on the site. He saw what was happening. It's when now he gave us a copy of the title deed and uh, the advertisement for tender. It was re-advertised. It's when now last month, late last month, is when they did the handing over of the, of the project to the contractor. And we've, they've given him a timeline of six months to complete the health facility. Thank you. Yeah, I think thanks a lot for that contribution, Christine. I think that's a great example of of also just holding local governments um to account, you know. And in this case, it was it actually was successful before we needed legal action. Go ahead, Peter. I see your hand is up. Yeah, um, I don't want to put uh, Tim Timothy on the spot. He's here with us, and it was our legal front uh for the action we took against the government. Uh, to demand information about the COVID, uh, uh, COVID tools, and um, uh, and uh, uh, so I, I I thought he would be able to contribute much more because he knows how long it took, which if ever it ever did, because we were a civil society led by our uh, uh, by Kellen. Uh, yeah. Tim Timothy is here. <laughs> Go ahead, thanks, thanks, Peter, uh, for not putting me on the spot. 
but yeah thanks for that so um i think yes as peter you've rightly put um during the pandemic uh just from the initial stages when the uh pandemic was uh um uh was reported the initial cases in kenya i think we as peter has rightly mentioned we led uh, several efforts to request for information several uh, pieces of information on various issues uh, from the government ranging from measures around quarantine isolation uh, vaccine and all that so our government so we do have an access to information law again uh, but uh, in that sense the government was really uh, non-responsive and one of the demands that we were making was that proactively the government should be able to provide this information so in um, all those requests for information that we did around the pandemic are subject of an ongoing case so we went now to court after we did not uh, received uh uh, all those information and this case is still ongoing. So currently we have uh, four cases related to COVID, one around access to information. We have two on vaccines, uh, one on isolation and another one on mandatory quarantine, all of which have not yet, uh, we've not yet been, uh, have not yet been uh, concluded, which has also been an issue. Uh, we've been uh, advocating for and having um, uh, some advocacy with the judiciary on how long uh, cases are taken, especially uh, cases of an urgent uh, nature during a pandemic. So we'll keep you updated uh, when the judgments come because um, yeah, all, 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 all of them are at the point where we are expecting uh, judgments on the same. So thank you. Um, yeah, bye. A lot for that contribution, Timothy. I think then this um this webinar, this meeting was really important uh, for all of us just to get on the same page and um emphasize our solidarity with all of you, um and to emphasize how courageous you are and how brave you are to take on um the government and hold them accountable. And it's something that is necessary and it must be done. And we're happy that it's it's you who are part of um, our membership who are doing it. Um, if there's any support we can provide, please let us know, um, and we'll be happy to provide that support. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for your for your contribution. I don't know if Malise, you have any closing statements, or in respect of people's time, we can. Yeah. Uh, just to to say, it was really inspiring to hear about uh, these important uh, initiatives and the the push for for access to information. I'm I'm going to keep my eyes out. Um, very much for uh, for what the results are in Kenya, and I, I believe that will will only strengthen um, uh, strengthen our uh, our push for for transparency. Um, the, uh, I'm just going to conclude by um, by noting that uh, I've put my my presentation uh, up in the in the chat box. Um, if people want to have some of those URLs, um, and then. Uh, if you're not familiar with the work from Transparency International, there's some of the links there. Uh, I think in a recent report, um, they've shown that uh, that more than 90% of uh, of contracts or known contracts have not been vaccine, known vaccine contracts for COVID have not been put in the public domain. So it means that it's only about uh, you know, less than 10% um, of people who know what, what their governments have contracted for. So the, the more we can push back against that, the better. Um, and to thank people for, for, for hosting this afternoon. It's, it's really been a, a delight to engage on this issue. Thank you so much, uh, Malise, and everyone who was able to join. I'm so happy to see we had representation from all across the continent, North Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa, East Africa, even Central Africa. This is this is great. Um, I'm happy that we were all able to benefit from this. And just to draw inspiration that um, it is possible, it has been done, and uh, all you need to do is um, request for the information and proceed from there. If you need help from PV Africa, um, you can reach out to Takuzo or myself. If you need um, any more information, we'll be sending you a comprehensive meeting report of all the proceedings of this meeting, just so that you can reflect um, and also uh, also look at the process that um, Mali spoke about, um, that HJI uh, went through, um, just in case this is something you were interested in pursuing as well. Um, in respect of your time, we thank you so much. Um, there's, there's a lot of work ahead uh, ahead of us, as Rasigan has rightfully said. But for now, I hope you enjoy your, your evening or your afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, have a good one.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everyone. Yeah. Very insightful. Thanks Thank all. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Catch you later. Bye.